Otara. Over 30 years ago, migrant Māori, Pākehā and new arrivals from the Pacific were thrown together as part of an idealistic social experiment. In the six years from 1961, Otara's population exploded from just over 3,000 to 20,000, making it the fastest growing area in the country. In anyone's language, a recipe for disaster. Otara was born. Back in the 60s, Otara was little more than a labour camp for the new industries and freezing works of South Auckland. From day one, New Zealand saw Otara as a ghetto. They look at Otara and all they see is slum. All they see are the outside of the houses. They whiz past with their cameras and they go, Otara is a ghetto, blah, 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 blah. I used to lie and, and uh, didn't say I was from Otara. I'd say I was from East Tamaki. Um, and when I was going for, for jobs. Whoever planned this, this, this community got it wrong. No, nobody here had a silver spoon in their mouth. And so there was only one way to go, really. That was up. This is the story 35 years later of that 60s generation who chose to defy the odds and use Otara as their springboard to success. We're at uh, 82A Beds Road, Otara, or Otara as it later became known. This block of flats and the block next door and the one next door to that were probably the first flats built in Otara at that time. This is where I, I was born and bred. Um, I lived uh, most of my, my life here up until I was about 23, 24. This is where we lived and went to school at Hillary uh, when we came in to, uh, to Otara from Samoa in 1962. This is where everything happened. This is where we get all our hidings. This is where we get all our feeds and more hidings. <laughs> this is my house in the background, uh, number 17 Alexander Crescent. And we moved here. Uh, where we moved in 1964. Across the road is Hillary College. Oh, it was just all farmland, right, right in front of us, there was nothing. So coming to this was just a, was a dream come true for us. Award-winning actor and writer Rawiri Paratini, one of that first generation, has returned to the Hokianga Harbour where he was born. Yeah, there it is. It's over there. It's yeah. got smaller. Yeah. Where is it? We used to say our rosary to get a house in Auckland. And that would have been um, our parents' desires. They'd said that the life for us isn't here. The life for us is in the city. The factory had closed. There literally was no school here. Small towns were being closed down. and. My parents wanted to give us the best opportunities. I can remember clearly coming over the hills north of Auckland and then suddenly Auckland just went whoosh, just opened up and there were all of these lights and it was like looking at a different planet. Auckland City in the 60s was New Zealand's boomtown, the mecca of the urban drift. Auckland was bursting at the seams. The government's answer was Otara, and for many families, it seemed the answer to their prayers. When we saw the house, and, and you know, mum and dad went up and put the key in, and it worked, and the door opened. You know, I think we were all waiting for. Certainly, my parents were waiting for that sort of surprise of, oh, well, you know, this isn't really our house, sort of thing. You know, someone's made a mistake. We were, that's how grateful we were. My parents made enough money to buy a piece of land and build a house. And they selected the piece of land at 24 Crown Crescent. In those days, there was no state housing out there or anything like that. There was big patches of vacant land. And then the big pile of dirt right across the street got moved. And we're kind of wondering what's going on. And next thing, they're putting in foundations. And, and now they're building state flats and, and state houses. And they and built the state house where uh, Francis Leilua and his family moved into. Right across the road there, uh, 
the first head boy of Hillary College, Gavin Gear. Uh, there were Palangis on the other side there. There was quite a few Palangis along on the street. But, uh, yeah, apart from uh, the type of people that live here, it's, uh, it has, has changed. But the houses are still the same. Yeah, a lot of memories. And we flew on the teal. We all stayed at my auntie's place. She lived in, o in Otara. And like most new families from, from the islands, they start off um, staying at, at the home. So there were two families there until uh, my parents got, got this house here, Crown Crescent. Everybody that was there was new, had come from different places. We from Waikato. Ooh, ooh, you are our enemy, eh? We didn't really know what we were saying. Yeah, you fellas used to eat people, they'd say to us. And they would go, yeah, we still might. <laughs> 50% of the houses were state-owned, and you could only stay six years, then you bought or you left. In 1972, Norman Kirk visited Ōtara and described the state as the worst landlord in New Zealand. Ōtara was done on the cheap, let's face it. Um, and that's where the anger of Ōtara comes from, I believe. I have no doubt that at least some of the assistance requested will be given. More important than anything the government can do for Otara is what the people of Otara can do for themselves. No paths, no garages, nothing. No money has ever been spent in Otara. The gyms that are there, we bought those. We walked the streets on walkathons. We got um, bottle drives. We built those. We built Puke Otara. We built the library, we put the books in the library, nobody else put those things there, we did. Ōtara was made by Ōtara. A cornerstone of Ōtara has always been its first secondary school, Hillary College, where the area's self-help spirit was fostered. When you sit for a salsa, you do not sit with your back bent, you do not slouch. Posture, girls, boys! Today, just as in those early years, much of the responsibility of leadership is shouldered by the pupils themselves. It started right from the time that we were in the third form, and I don't quite know where it started, but um, we would go and play other schools uh, at various sports, and we were looked down upon. And one thing I realised that uh, in Ōtara, that our pupils would need more than anything else was a sense of self-esteem because that would, was being rapidly taken away f from them by a stupidly hostile, or not hostile, but derogatory press. I don't know, media just gets hold and, and says, oh, well, you know, there's too many brown faces there, this must be a bad area. And whammo, she's all, you know, all over the papers. And a bad area is how it was portrayed. Tin City. Stormtroopers. Disease may lurk in Ōtara Lake. Dump for crims. The press had a field day. Certainly for, for us as teenagers, I think that we, we grouped together and we found, um, we found strength in that. You heard about the name Ōtara being bad and all that. Well, that's not done by us, it's been done by outsiders. And everyone that wants to come in and do a bad name to Ōtara, well, we just turn around and give them beans. That Afro-head gang spokesman, Francis Lailua, has now been a teacher at Hillary College for 17 years, and he credits his gang leader days as a training ground for his current role. The gang might have been made up of children, but their work was serious. Still, Francis can look back at those days with a smile. OK. Second patch. My mum found the other one under the bed. <laughs> What's this? Oh, I belong to so and so. Don't you ever get you with the batch. <laughs> you belong to a Kang, she was saying. You're like, no, 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 man. Where did this name Stormtroopers come from? Hitler. From where? Germany. From Germany. Yeah. One of the guys were reading a comic and uh, so they said, hey, here's a name. He was reading a war comic, of course, and uh, he said, uh, Stormtroopers. I reckon it's, it's powerful than Hells Angels and these other. Gangs, the, the Thunderbirds and all the others. What they do is just paint the whole, the denim jacket black and then let it dry. It became quite hard and then we just sort of painted stormtroopers on it. 
Yeah, and uh, we were sort of a, a a gang, you know, a sort of one of those uh, real rough gangs. I mean, we just got together and we just wanted to be like those other guys. Before, we didn't have, you know, no gangs. We just walking around. And these outsiders from other districts, they coming in and beat hell out of uh, the boys out here they see on the street. That follows from Otara. Bang. That follows from Otara. Bang. So uh, we got together and started to make a big group and we were ready for the blokes from the outside. We were being hammered by bikey gangs, adults. We're talk I'm talking like we're 13, 14, and I'm talking, you know, bikey gangs are in their 20s, and they were coming from Newmarket and from town um, and banging us. The Mardi Gras is a, is a big one that, that stands out. Um, the riots that we had down there, and it was the Hells Angels that came in to, um, to deal to the stormtroopers. It was a big gathering and we had some bands and we got wind that there was going to be, we were going to get hit. And I still remember the roar, the thunder, and uh, one of the guys sort of came rushing in and, and, and he said to me, they said, they said, there's about 50 bikies coming from the motorway. This line of bikes comes in off the motorway, the new motorway, comes around down and comes in awesome sight and everyone was prepared. They came in, everyone made a path for them to come in because otherwise you get run over. They weren't going fast and they came in and then organised, I wasn't one of them, and organised troops of people picked up these things and rammed them. They charged these bikes and crashed them off. They sat down and did a battle plan because that's what you do when you go to war. <laughs> the adults that were there sort of helped out with the... Um, it was just, everybody was everywhere, chucking the guys off the bikes and smashing the bikes up. And they were nice bikes too. They'd come in to deal to us, and they got dealt to. The cops arrived and dealt to us. They arrested us. We were the aggressors. Uh, there were, I remember this for the rest of my life because it was, I was part of mass hysteria. A riot erupted. We kids went smashing through the shopping centre. We had been caught up in this mass hysterical thing. Um, we smashed windows. We, I was part of that. We went in and we grabbed, I can remember, rubbish bins of shoes from the shoe shops. Everyone had flash shoes for a while. It's not too often you get a full-on gang brawl like that, really. It was one of the first of the, sort of like the modern gang brawls in New Zealand. And like we were all secondary school kids then, and uh, we, we weren't participants, but we were right there, and uh, we were a part of the uh, the chaos and the terror that happened uh, at that evening. After leaving school, Ben Dalton went on to become a political activist, taking a particular interest in Māori issues, and then, like Francis before him, took a leading role in another local gang. The tribesman was an environment where the whole issue was brotherhood, really. The, the code of the tribesmen at that time was everybody looks after each other. Now one thing I learnt from here is that uh, if you get knocked down, get back up again and keep going. And also, don't keep thinking somebody else has to chuck a rope to you because they, they might not chuck it and if they don't, you're going to drown. So, so you just got to get yourself out of there really. Getting out of there wasn't easy. But Hillary College and its staff played a vital role, and to the students they provided an educational and personal stepping stone to the future. We were very defensive about who we were and our school. We were very prideful. You know, we had um, a lot of very positive reinforcement from um, the Johnsons and their staff, and um, we thought we were great. They were a tremendous bunch of kids. Of, 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 of young people. They had such energy and such belief in themselves and such hope for the future that you couldn't miss catching it. I can remember Ian Mitchell, one essay I wrote, him, him putting on it, um, this is disgusting, if this is the best you can do, you're in deep trouble. And uh, um, when, when you used to have like uh, private discussions with him, he'd say the future uh, of the Māori races in the hands of um, the people who are going to be intellectuals in the future, that kind of thing, and he'd say, and uh, I had thought you'd be one of them. He introduced me to Shakespeare, 
the, the messages that Hamlet was trying to, the person Hamlet on the stage was trying to get across to all the people around him were right. There was something rotten in the state of Denmark. And he was the only one that was game enough to admit it. And, and he was the only one that was bold enough to address it and confront it, you know. Just as there was something rotten in the state of Otara or something rotten in the state of Wellington, you know, and it was the young eyes that could see it. What I'd like to do now, probably for the next 10 years at least, is sort of uh, get fully involved in um, Māori economic development. That's one of the reasons why I went back to university in the last couple of years and did an MBA. I knew that time was coming and I felt like getting the right sort of uh, equipment for the job. I just got recently appointed to the Economic Development Commission, which will be a step in the right direction, hopefully. Since the 1960s, Ōtara has undergone dramatic change. Up until the 1970s, lucrative employment for all could be found in the nearby South Auckland industrial areas. But then, all that started to change. Slowly they closed Penrose down. Freezing works. 400 people. Westfield one day, South Down one day, bing, 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 gone. Otahu workshop, railway workshop. All my uncles and that redundant. Gone, ping, no. No bus for you to catch, no place for the bus to go to. Now Dad's not going to work. Mum and Dad have a bit more tension at home. You know, Mum and Dad have a few more fights. Dad pings Mum. This upsets son and daughter. And all of those things start to happen, you know. Dad's bored and wild. Takes it out on his boy. Takes it out on his girl. Takes it out on his wife. Um, wife gets ho ha with all of that. Goes, leaves. Family gets split up. Hi, any fresh snapper? I was brought up by my grandma and we lived right up north, up in the Kaitaia district. Moved with my nan to Otara and there was no other children there. And I said, Nan, where do I go to school? And she said, oh, the school, you know, the school will be up there, dear. And I said, well, who's going to take me? How am I going to know where it is? And she just looked out and up the main road, I saw kids going in batches. She said, well, you just follow those kids and they'll lead you to school. And as you grew, you know, your uniform became shorter and shorter. I remember going back to my grandma and saying, Nan, look, I cannot wear this. Look, it's right up here and I'm, gonna, I'm getting into trouble. And we didn't have the money for a new uniform. So I was in tears because I was sick of being told off about this uniform. We only had, I only had the one. So my grandmother took down a curtain. Now, a uniform, as I said, was a pink check. My grandmother took down a green curtain. And I thought, what on earth is she going to do with this curtain? There's no hem left. She can't put green on the bottom. And she took out the waist, and she added this strip about this wide to the waist. of the, So I had this, the length came down where it was meant to come down. I had this big green bit in the middle and a pink bodice. So I went, went around the whole of summer with a jersey on. And my friends say, aren't you hot? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not hot. No, I'm not. <laughs> but, you know, you, you and look, I thought, this is never going to happen to my children. I got married very young, 16 when I got married, had a bubby at 17 and uh, as a consequence was on my own at 21 um, with three little bubbies. My boss at the time changed my hours so that I could work from 11 o'clock at night till 7am in the morning, took in a cousin who boarded with me and he gave my baby his feed at about 3 o'clock in the morning because I'd go to work at 11 and um, so I would just have to fit in that I could get some sleep during the day so that I could go back to work at 11 o'clock that night. Started off in a lunch bar, ended up in a hotel, bought a hotel with my partner and 
bought the lease, bought the freehold, moved on and bought another one, had a house in Remira, all the, all the things that money can buy. So prior to being 30, I could probably be classified as a millionaire. Sharon went on to develop hotel businesses in Australia, but like a lot of expat Kiwis on that side of the ditch, felt the call to return home. She now puts her skills to work as the Chief Executive Officer of an iwi trust based at Te Puya Marae in Mangere. My grandmother had lots to do with this marae, so I guess that's probably why I'm here at Tamaki Kararo. Some some instances it's a, maybe a part of giving back. Uh, she was a very special lady and I don't think I'd be the person I am today without her. A lot of the parents had um, parties that would last days, not just one night. Um, when we'd go to bed, we would take the younger ones with us, where we stayed overnight at these parties, and we would take the younger ones with us and put knives through the, the bedroom door to make sure that there were no male intruders throughout the night. A lot of kids at school would talk about that. Rhonda left school at 15 and, like a lot of her friends, had a baby a year later. But that didn't stop her childhood dream of heading overseas. I always wanted to travel. That was just my main ambition. I didn't really have a career goal in mind as such. I just wanted to travel. So, um, and I remember watching a, um, a program on television when I was about 10 or 11 and um, I announced to my family that I was going to go to Hollywood one day which everyone laughed at, and I wasn't sure how on earth I was going to get there. Um, but I eventually did. I eventually did. My daughter and I lived in Australia for eight years, and then I came back to New Zealand for a couple of years, and then went to live in the UK. When I finally came back to settle, um, I decided that um, this is it, career time. Uh, so I went back to school. I went back to Carrington Tech and did some studies there. I worked in various corporate uh, offices for, for a few years and then had the opportunity to go into business. Hey John. Hi Ronald. We'll just do another take on that guy going into the greenhouse, Lee. I'm rolling now. Nowadays Rhonda works in the movie business. She's the managing director of Air Force Digital, a sound studio in Auckland. On the other hand, Monterey, California is about as far away as you can get from the streets of Ortara. Gavin Gear is now a millionaire and his business is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, this is where it all started about 1976. Hi, how are you today? Uh, we opened up our first location. Um, it was borrowed jewellery and uh, we were off and running, we were in business. This is the Elegant Illusion store that we opened up in 1988. And we were looking for a idea that we could franchise or duplicate, something that we could take out in multiples. And now we're at 24 stores and we've just announced that we're going to take the, st the company up to 300 stores. Gavin is the former head boy and ducks of Hillary College. And after moving to the United States, he's found his place in the sun. But like the people he grew up with back home, come Saturday morning, he and his wife Tamara love nothing more than a stroll through the bargains of the local flea market. When I got to Otara, I built myself this trolley. And for some reason, I don't, I don't recall why, I dropped the trolley. And one of the wheels, one of the front wheels, just shattered into a thousand pieces that was cast iron. And that was the first time in my life when I realised that I had no money. So there was a real frustration with not being able to fix that trolley. And at that point, I made, I made a conscious decision that I would never ever be in that position ever again in my life where I was stuck because I didn't have money. Gavin may now live in Monterey, but he still keeps in touch with his old friends. Rhonda stops by on her way to London to catch up. Hi Kim. Hello. How you Hi. doing? Good, how are you? Kim, this is uh, an old school friend of mine. Hi. Uh, Rhonda. Hi Kim. Hi. Zealand. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Well, what we specialize in is these uh, lab created stones. For example, what you're looking at right here is a piece of 
real emerald material that's grown in a gem lab. Mm -hmm. In other words, it didn't come out of the ground. It was grown, in, grown by man. It's synthetic. Okay. But it's not green glass pretending to be an emerald. It is a real emerald. Wings pretending to be an emerald. Can you get any of the New Zealand beers here? Yeah. Where? We get Steinlager. Oh, yeah. And in Steinlager, we use that for dishwashing liquid. <laughs> Dear farm. The circumstance in which we are born into and that we exist in has absolutely nothing to do with. It's absolutely irrelevant. It means nothing in terms of the way we're going to turn out as an adult and what it is that we're going to accomplish in our adult life. And if we can get that, if we can understand that, you know, the world's a pretty big place. And any one of us, any one of us in Otara can pick our spot in the world and go on and do great things. Uh, I did have the vision for, for Hillary College that it would be like Te Aote, that it would provide uh, leaders, leaders for the Maori community in the future, even members of parliament, which, which it has not. Well, the place hasn't changed. The lounge. I had to share this bedroom with two other, my two other brothers. This is where I had my 21st, 1981. Man, there must have been about 60 people here. And we all managed to get pretty uh, intoxicated. The kitchen, I remember on the inside of one of the cupboard, cupboard uh, doors, there was a roster. And it said uh, who was going to wash, who was going to dry, who was going to set and who was going to clear. Not anymore. Stick my dishes in the dishwasher these days. Kids get it easy. This all used to be a garden, here, and the famous Southern Motorway. We used to sit out here, watch the cars go by, run across the motorway. All of that across the motorway was a, was a farm, and they had a hay barn over there. We set that alight. You know, looking back on it, no, I suppose what, what it taught you was how to survive. Golden Hunt justified $29,000 on a taxi fare. And you people should do your job about investigating that. Eat your yes. words. Eat your words. Eat your words. Don't worry about it, bro. A lot of people would, would say that that's what they, they learnt from this place, from Ōtara, was how to survive, how to get on. The Ōtara survivor may now be looking at his old haunts through a politician's sunglasses, but for Tohenari, what makes Ōtara special has always been the people. If Bill Birch dropped a billion dollars in here tomorrow, it wouldn't help. What it would do would be, it would give some people some money and they'd most probably leave, and then you would be left with the same, uh, the same situation. I mean, there are a lot of community organisations that will put their heart and soul into this place, and it's them they're the ones that really make the difference. It's not government, it's not the, the government departments, it's actually the people that live here and who are committed uh, to, to seeing something better for the people that live in this community. So you're being actors here, even though you're dancing, it's an actors piece, okay? So there's no person there, somebody just, just turn around and go and grab them, okay? Go, go to grab them, grab them. Rauri Paratini now runs an acting course at the Rawini campus of Northland Polytech. The lessons learnt on the streets of Ōtara can even find their resonance in the drama workshop. When I was in sixth form at Hillary College, Ian Mitchell, our English teacher, took us all in to watch Hamlet. The lesson that I learnt that day was that drama is powerful. Drama can make you see yourself. Martha! I think I've got tomorrow's race results. I went home and wrote a letter to the director of the Mercury Theatre. My name is David Broughton. I am a fifth former at Hillary College. Can I come and work for you? Boom. That was it. Two years after I saw Hamlet, I was working at the Mercury. For many kids from Ōtara, you were either in conflict or trying to resolve conflict. Hey, hey! You were jabbering while I was talking, when I was going through the action with you. We always. Like, was like, I you just want to know about it.
I'll tell you why. I'll... No, you stay there. It's funny, but the, the very nature of drama courses means that students have to yep. confront all kinds of issues. And listen, listen up. I see it as my job as um, trying to channel their passion or anger or whatever into something creative. It's all about turning negatives into positives, really. I want them to have a job. I want them to feel part of this industry and to get into it because I think because they're in there they've got something to offer. That's my first thing for them and that's that's how I work. I work to try and prepare them to go and knock on doors. Maybe we should just go to the first section, Russell. Basically, uh, and, and s I know you're looking at the words, but if you could sing it a little more to someone that you really love and, and speak those words to someone. I think they meant it when they said you can buy love. Now I know you can rent it and release you on my love. On love, be my love. There's always been heaps of talent from around here. Uh, especially musical talent. We used to gather behind the toilets, behind the milk sheds, down by the creek with guitars and sing and make stuff up, make songs up. Yeah, there was lots of talent. Never had that many opportunities. Never had any of this, the community centre and um, OMAC. Uh, would have been great to have that. But um, we made the best of our opportunities. At one stage, a group from the New Zealand Opera Company came to Ōtara and they came to our school and they were looking for Polynesian talent to take part. And that's what's going on here today. A group has come from Australia, from New York, to cast a, a musical which is going to tour all over Australia and they want the same thing. Multi-talented Polynesians who look good, who can dance and sing and... The only people who can't see that we can do that are ourselves. 5,000, 2,500, 600 minutes. 525,000 journeys to plan. 525,600 minutes. How can you measure the life of a woman or a man? That Polynesian shy thing. It's a strength rather than a weakness because it means that you are prepared to hide in the shade and watch what's going on before you make your move. <laughs> Basically that's all shyness is. doesn't mean that you're not going to have a go at winning the girl's heart for example. It just means that you let the people that are bolder than you make the mistakes first. <laughs> but in return you get Joy that could never be told, and in return, you gave me love that was more precious than gold. So, whatever you have to give, you don't have to be ashamed. No, no, just come as you are and present it in Jesus' name for in return. I think it's criminal that it's still untapped. I think that's ridiculous. I mean, there's been a pool of talent here probably deeper than any pool anywhere in the country and one of the deepest pools in the world, and the fact that it's untapped is criminal. Jesus. He's a big winner in Ōtara, with 350 churches serving a largely Pacific Islands population. Ōtara is possibly the most Christian town in New Zealand. Here, religion is one of the great passions, a vital fabric that helps tie this community together. But there is another equally favoured passion, and that's sport. It was New Zealand's big game that set Francis Lelua onto a new road after his involvement with the gang movement. Rugby took over. I was still in the stormtroopers. 
I actually sort of used to turn up still with a patch on and then all these stormtroopers on the side and no wonder we won. <laughs> they all wanted to play in the middle of the field, they didn't want to go on the sideline and all these stormtroopers on the side. Who oh. scored that? So here we are, we're taking the boy out of Otara and sort of chaining him down in central Auckland. So. And his whole sort of attitude changed and, and sort of don't, oh, I don't feel like training, you know. So I had to go to training, so oh, I didn't go. You know, fuck, I'm a bit shy, you know. Confidence is nothing, I just, you just don't want to go out of the, the environment. I mean, I was like that, you know. Um, Every time I go into town and sort of do a bit of business there, and I quite often sometimes can't wait to get there. As soon as I sort of see the sign of the motor, I can relax now, I'm home. And you might just might change your mind about becoming a professional sportsman because it involves a whole lot of, lot of things, and that's including um, your attitude towards the sport, okay? Francis has become a prime mover of the Ōtara sporting community. Early on, he had a hand in setting up Auckland's first sports academy. I think they need to understand that there's more to it than just playing the game. There's, a lot of them don't realise the hard work that goes into it. If you don't perform, then you're not going to get paid. And a lot of them are looking at getting paid. If Ōtara in the 60s was a failed social experiment, by way of contrast, it's worth a look at the Hwani Waititi Kura Kaupapa, a school in West Auckland, regarded as one of the most successful alternative education initiatives this country's seen. And it proves that producing successful people is about investing in our kids. This is where the Minister of Māori Affairs, Tau Henare, sent his children. I look at all the resources that our young kids have got, like my kids and at Hwani Waititi, and I go, geez, you're lucky because all we had was a school. Hallowy College didn't have a lot, of, a lot of resources, but what it did have was 1,200 kids. Now it's got 300 odd. The numbers attending Hillary College may well have declined, but its influence remains. Today's students still maintain a proud heritage. <laughs> the Auckland Secondary School's Polynesian Festival is the biggest Polynesian festival in the world and it was originally conceived and staged by that first generation. What happened in Ōtara is what must happen to the whole country. It is a seminal place, if you like. And uh, I wouldn't mind a New Zealand like Ōtara. It would suit me fine. there is one thing we can all learn from this story, it's that whatever street you live on, it can either be your boundary or you can defy the odds and let it be your springboard to greater things. It's over to you. What's the piece of Ōtala that are carrying? Well sometimes when I'm getting hassled by somebody, I often sit there thinking, you know, not only am I more intelligent than you, I could probably, I could probably, I could probably demolish you physically too. And uh, I mean, you never have to actually do it. You can just keep it in your mind that, yes, that's there. The secret is, is your attitude to how you let the different things in life affect you because it doesn't go right for anybody. Um, there's always going to be hard times and there are things that happen that you have no control over, but you do have control over how much you allow them to affect you. I say that I'm the result of that particular period in, in history. 
you know, where the Maoris, the Polynesians, the white folks all came to Otar. I'm a direct result. My success is directly a result of that particular circumstance. It is about being proud of yourself. It is about standing up and being counted and, and not being afraid to be seen. It is about being um, being who you are. Hey, we know what we're here to do. Let's just do it. Lord Batimala, hurry! Hurry! I can't hear you. Lord Batimala, hurry! Hurry! Thank you. Otara, like right from my seven-year-old eyes, it excited me. And I've seen so much destruction there, but it still excites me. If we've got what we've got from Otara now, just imagine, just imagine what places like that. Otara isn't, isn't the only place like it either. Just imagine what they've got to give. Me, homeboy as I am, you know, this is where I'll stay. I'm not quite sure if I win the lottery, it might be a bit different. I might buy a nice home in Otara. <laughs>